My name is Christopher Izet. Um, I'm a historian of Qing, China, and I teach at the University of Minnesota in the States. And this year I have uh, been affiliated with the um, Academia Sinica and the uh, Institute for Modern History there. I'll probably begin by saying something about uh, how it fits into the field. Um, for a long time, one of the big questions uh, for historians, people looking at history, was why, uh, given all of its advances, China did not arrive at the Industrial Revolution, or uh, others might phrase it as a modern economy, capitalism. Why that originated in Europe, which at one point in time seemed like an uh, unlikely contender, in fact. So the question was really about why it didn't develop. And then about uh, 12 years ago, a book by an historian, Kenneth Pomerantz, came out, which um, countered that by saying, well, in fact, uh, it was the case that the divergence of Europe from China was much later than we think. It was not until, didn't come until the 19th century. And rather than lagging behind Europe, uh, China actually was on parity with Europe. Uh, particularly Europe's most advanced parts, Britain, Northwest Europe, um, until the early 19th century. In the end, what Pomerantz argued was that um, there weren't really significant differ differences between most advanced parts of Europe and China. That argument generated a lot of discussion, but a lot of also new research. Uh, and part of that outcome of that has been a series of uh, wage studies, people who've looked at what did people in the past earn, average workers earn, in Europe, different parts of the world, Europe mostly, um, and uh, China, I think also Japan, they include in these studies, uh, and of course, what those wages could buy. So you get a kind of a, a guess, a, a look at standards of living. And those studies have actually shown uh, that the divergence between the most advanced parts of Europe and China was actually much earlier than the 19th century, probably by 1600. Uh, the study I'm working on here is part of that search for um, new evidence. And historians for quite some time have been looking at um, changes in the average height of a population to get a sense of changes in primarily, primarily in nutrition. Uh, the average height of a population uh, reflects how much, how many calories really a person in, takes in over their growing years. It also reflects things like the disease environment of that population, uh, the shelter, you know, warmth, things of that sort. But food is really, really key. calories, food are key. And because most pre-modern populations never reach their full height potential, you see these sort of trend lines going up and down. So what we've done for China is to take uh, homicide records, or really wrongful death cases. There's about a million of them in Beijing. And there's also a, a copy of the collection here in Taiwan, which is why I'm, why I'm here. And uh, we've taken these wrongful death cases and looked at the coroner's reports within them, which include uh, the height of the victim, uh, as well as other information about the victim, their name, where they're from, where they grew up, where they died, how, they, uh, how old they were when they died, their gender, of course. Basic information we need to know about the person uh, for this study. And uh, we've gathered about close to 10,000 heights, and we're beginning to look at trend lines. And what we're finding, in fact, is uh, stagnation across the 18th century, that there, there were, in fact, no improvements in the standards of living, which uh, looks very much like the wage studies that have been going on. Um, we've been happy to see evidence of shocks in the environment too in our population. So when we, we know periods of, and places where there are famine, wars, we can actually see the effect on our population. They, they, they drops off quite ra uh, dramatically at these, these points, these shocks, and then recovers, but always recovers to where it was before. Uh, so uh, our preliminary re results, our results at this point, s s seem to reinforce the idea that, in fact, uh, if we're going to look, search for the origins of the divergence between China 
and the advanced parts of Europe, we have to go before the 18th century. It happens sometime before the Qing Dynasty, which is when our data begins. Our, our data goes roughly from 1680 to about 1780. And it covers that century. We're going to push it up into, the, into 1800, hopefully, by the end of the next year. So, in short, it really helps us to construct models and interpretations of change, uh, specific, particularly the economy, but other aspects that are sort of tied into the economy as well. What we can provide are the tools the analytical models, the frameworks, the kind of modes of analysis. We're trying to understand big changes. Why do all of us, why do we see these sort of massive shifts in the distribution of the balance of power, of wealth across the globe? These kinds of bigger questions that I think uh, have a lot of bearing on the contemporary world. Only through the examination of past information that we can construct these models. If all we had was the information of the moment, we'd have a very sort of odd understanding of, of, of the world. It wouldn't have a, a direct past, it wouldn't have a direction, it wouldn't have any momentum, it would just be a moment in time. But by uh, looking at the past, we can construct models that are much more dynamic and, um, and, and therefore much more accurate in some ways of trying to understand big transformations. Mm -hmm.